Oh my! You girls, this place is a mess. You gotta stop leaving your petticoats lying around all over the place. And our guests will be here soon. What do you think this is? Oh, Betty Joe, Billy Joe, Bobby Joe, where are you? Don't tell me. Don't tell me that you're swimming in the water supply again. That is so unsanitary. It's disgusting. People have to drink that water. Wait till Uncle Joe hears about this. Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe, are you moving kind of slow? Oh, wait till he hears about this. I, I am so panicked. Our guests are almost here and I'm freaking out. This place is a mess. Everything's, everything's going crazy. Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe. Okay, I feel a little bit better. All right. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining me tonight for Living Figuratively. This is the 29th episode where I will take you to my guest room for a shady rest to my guest room. Um, the stairs that I just walked down are the, are the stairs down to our guest room because our guest room is in the walkout basement. So when you're first walking down the stairs, the first thing that you see, even from the top of the stairs, is this little setup over here and this little painting. This painting is, um, it's, call, it's called Doppelganger and it is something that I did the second time I did uh, the Seven Deadly Sins. I did the Seven Deadly Sins as a board game for my BFA back in 1986 for my BFA presentation. So it was like a year long project focusing on the Seven Deadly Sins, which are sloth, gluttony, lust, greed, pride, jealousy, and rage. Um, and you'll notice that the seven deadly sins are actually, they're just kind of like normal human emotions where taken to extremes, yes, they can be very, you know, damaging to you and stuff like that, but they're not the really bad ones. They're not like murder and stealing and hypocrisy and tricking people and, um, you know, like, like really bad, really bad sins. Uh, they're really more just like the human emotions. So that's why it was a very fun theme to try to tackle. And I was working on this particular Seven Deadly Sins painting um, was from a portrait session with Cleveland filmmaker Robert Banks. And he posed for the, the still one, but I asked him to do some rageful poses because I wanted to try to do this sort of doppelganger rage type thing. And, um, and I felt it was a very impactful, powerful kind of painting, which is why I put it right at the bottom of the stairs like this, so you can actually see it from up above. It, that is a, a decorating concept that, um, that they do in, at uh, galleries, too, where you might have a very powerful, large, colorful, impactful piece up way across the room in a gallery to call people into it. And so once people, you know, go all the way across the gallery to see the big one, then they have to see the other ones as they're, as they're walking out and walking around. So that's kind of a, a visual, visual trick, which I did with this painting. Right under it, we have a little bit of curated clutter. Um, I'm going to tell you the, the, the accessories that I've decorated here with are pottery that my kids have done when they were little. And we took a lot of pottery classes. My kids weren't so much into painting. They did do drawing, but they were not so much into painting. But we took a lot, a lot of pottery classes. And because I love all the little stuff that they made, I saved a lot of it. So, you know, many of these pieces are, you know, almost 20 years old. And I thought it would just be a fun place to, to arrange them. This table, one of the fun stories about this table, um, it, well, it's actually a sad, fun story um, because my, one of my favorite stores, it's a lampshade store in Lindhurst, Ohio, was going out of business because of COVID. This, they opened back up again after all the COVID lockdowns, but they were not opening back up again to stay. They were opening back up to sell off all their inventory and their display items. 
uh, this table was one of their display items. The, which was, you know, selling for very cheap. The, um, the table top was actually just three very ordinary beige tiles that fit into the, you know, the, there were like compartments for the beige tiles. Um, but what I did with it instead, because I just loved how the, the, the iron on the bottom was, I had some old pieces of reclaimed wood from a different project called up our cabinet maker who did the cabinetry in our house when we built it and we are still on very good terms because I didn't torture him during the process even though one would think I might have but I was I guess maybe nice when I tortured him <laughs> um, and so he will come and do a small job for us too and so what I had him do was take these couple pieces of reclaimed wood that we had glued them together in that carpentry kind of way and he created this tabletop. It's really nice and heavy and reclaimed wood and I think it just makes a nice powerful impact right here at the bottom of the basement stairs. Let's go around. This is all sort of the entryway to the guest room. It's a little bit of a welcome area. We have a pinball machine which doesn't take quarters so anybody can can play it. This painting right here is one that has not seen a whole lot of action. She was in the Brindu show a couple years ago um, but aside from that she's kind of stayed close to home this it's called earth and it's my model who was the first Wiccan that I had ever that I ever had ever met um, in uh, in Pennsylvania she posed for one of my workshops and the it's called earth because of the Wiccan respect for the, you know, the natural, the, the elements of the earth and everything, which is the earth and then the air and water and fire. Um, so there, I have another painting of her called Air, which I think you guys might remember from my uh, master bedroom episode. And I've got two more in my, you know, back burner, which would be the the uh, fire and the water one. Over here, I have more of my, my kids' art. This is with some lovely pieces by Mark, which were featured in a movie that he did. Um, and then this little gem of a painting here by Paul Kesar was something that I snagged at the six by nine auction at the Portrait Society a couple years ago. And I love hanging things in the basement with sky in them because, you know, in the basement there isn't a whole lot of sky because, you know, it's the basement. So this little gem was absolutely perfect right here, especially behind the, behind the tree. All right, so let's come on into the actual guest room. So if you were to stay with us, this is the room where we would be putting you. Um, I'm going to pan around real quick and you can just see what, it, what everything kind of looks like. And then we will come back over here and start at start our 360 tour at the three o'clock spot if the bed is the 12 o'clock spot. That's right. So this wall right here, the pieces that I have on this wall are unified by a color theme. The color is this sandy pale yellow. You know, like kind of a yellow, a lemon yellow that's a little bit even more dusty than a lemon yellow. And um, the two larger anchor pieces, the way that I've designed everything is with an odd number of pieces. I've got five of them. The two larger anchor pieces are just about the same size, and I've got them staggered. This one right here is a life drawing from back in the day. It's like, I want to say it was 1983. Yeah, it was probably from art school. Um, where I used to do, where I would gesso uh, paper, and gesso is sort of an acrylic paint that you put down on paper first, and it's also what you put down before you oil paint on a canvas. Um, but I would gesso the paper and then do uh, pastel on it. And so this was kind of during my Egon Schiele kind of phase, so I've got sort of more of an expressive, exaggerated uh, figure, figure there. Um, the, the three portraits are our kids, three cousins, who I painted once upon a time back when we all went on a beach vacation together. And, you know, I've got the sandy dunes and, and everything behind them, so that, you know, continues the sandy color. And the way that I've placed them, 
it's kind of in this circular pattern, but I do have this straight line going up the middle because that just seemed to make sense. The other anchor piece right here is this gorgeous serigraphic print by uh, Virgil Thrasher. Um, this was a piece that I, it's not figurative, but it's, you know, it kind of worked perfectly with the, with the color scheme that I had going here. Virgil Thrasher, I had never heard of him until I stumbled upon this piece at a antique store. And um, one of the, I don't know if you guys remember, one of my rules for buying antique art at antique stores is it has to be good and it has to be real. Because if it's good, but it's just a print of a great master or whatever, it's like, you know, who needs it? I'd rather buy a new one. And if it's real, but it's not that good, who needs it? I'd rather buy a good one. Um, but this one was good and real. And it's a limited edition print, so it's not, um, you know, like a poster that's mass produced. It's a limited edition print, which, if you remember from my printmaking episode, um, there's a little number right here. It's print number, there's, it's an edition of 300, and this was number 279, and it was done in 1981, and it's hand signed by the artist, and the name of the, of the piece of art is here. It's called Still Pond. And I just love the different layering effects. It's just impeccably beautifully, beautifully done with this different layering effects. And, um, and you know, and the way that the trees have these little threads, it, it's, it's really just a, a, just a gorgeous piece. So it became part of, part of this wall and it's now in my guest room. All right, we'll come around. One of the things that I did with the guest room, because when we moved into this house, um, we ended up, I'm going to sit down. We ended up with a, a lot of extra furniture, uh, because there were some things where we bought furniture, you know, and some things where we put our old furniture into the new rooms and it was just like, uh, not, not quite right. So we ended up with some leftover furniture. We gave away a lot of it. Um, we don't, you know, we donated it to the furniture bank in Cleveland where, uh, people that are transitioning out of homelessness can go and pick out furniture for their new house. And so like, I felt like that was a really good way to, you know, pay it forward and everything. This particular chair right here came from my parents' house. Um, this was my dad's Archie Bunker chair. This was the chair that he always sat in. You know, he's not an Archie Bunker type, but this was his Archie Bunker, Archie Bunker chair. These, the nightstands here were nightstands from our old bedroom. Um, which I loved. I loved the rustic wood and everything, but they just didn't go with the new direction that we were going to. So they ended up down here. The bed for the mess, for the uh, guest room we bought new. Um, we were doing a wrought iron thing, so I echoed the wrought iron of the bed up in the curtains. And since this is a walkout basement, there is a view out of the window, so you feel kind of like you're in a, in a real room. These are some vintage lamps that I got at an antique store and I had them rewired. Whenever I buy antiques lamps, I have them rewired because I don't want to cause a fire. Uh, we have bells because we have had <coughs> convalescence in here and it's nice for them to have a bell to ring and if I hear it, then that's even better. So far, nothing bad has happened, so, <laughs> so that's been okay. Um, let me take you a little bit further along. This lovely piece right here, okay, has a bit of a story behind it too. Um, back in the 1980s, remember when black lacquer was all that in a bag of chips? Everybody was doing the black lacquer. I totally followed suit with the whole black lacquer thing. We had the black lacquer end tables and furniture and couches and things like that. Um, when black lacquer kind of got out of favor a little bit. The next thing after that was French country and hand painted stuff. And with the black lacquer stuff, I was following a trend. I did not love it and identify with it somehow, but I, it was what was out there. It was what was available. And it was cheap because you could use cheap wood and then just put that black plasticky shiny stuff on top of it. And so you could get cheap furniture and it was a good way to transition out of our, you know, milk crates, college furniture into buying real grown-up furniture. 
But fortunately, black lacquer kind of gave way to the French country craze. And so like right in the beginning of the 1990s, French country was da bomb and all that in a bag of chips. That was also when we moved to North Carolina, which North Carolina at the time, and maybe still, is the furniture capital of the United States. Um, so we went to High Point, North Carolina, where they make all the furniture and went shopping for furniture. And you know, it's got some great bargains. This one being one of the greatest bargains that we got. We just fell in love. Well, I fell in love with it. I'm not sure if my husband fell in love with it specifically, but I fell in love with it because it was hand painted and it was French country and it had this chicken wire on there that makes it just that much more farmy and stuff. So this piece has traveled with us to all the places that we've lived. Um, it started out being the TV cabinet and it, it, it's pretty deep so we could fit one of those fat back TVs into it and a really heavy one and it didn't break through. So that was pretty cool. Um, the next place that we lived after that, we, I think we used it as a TV cabinet for two places. Then when we finally moved into our first grown up house that we bought, um, we had built in TV cabinet, so we didn't need this for a TV cabinet anymore. So at that point, we used it in our dining room as a dining room hutch. And at that time, what I did was I took the inside and I painted it this uh, the same peach that, that, that you see out here. It had previously been darker, but I, paint, I repainted it the peach, and I had another shelf made for it so that we could, you know, put our dishes and, you know, fancy, fancy chinaware in there. So then, and, and actually in that dining room, I did some faux finishing based on the colors of this because I just really, it was just such a centerpiece um, that a lot of times I will paint the walls based on a really focal, interesting piece instead of painting the walls first and then finding pieces to go with it. So finally, when we moved here, we didn't need it for a dining room hutch anymore because we had built things there too. So it came down and became the focal centerpiece for the guest room. And we actually painted the walls that well, the walls have that peachy soft pumpkin color that this one that, that, that you find here too. So this kind of set the stage for the, you know, for the room. And it's a bookshelf now, and there's drawers down here, so if somebody stays long enough to put stuff in drawers, they can do that. Though, if anybody stays for too long, I end up painting them quite a bit. Um, up on top of it, opportunities for curated clutter. That vase right back there, uh, at some point when I was faux finishing the dining room, because I was faux finishing the dining room in our old house to match this thing, I did the vase too because I thought, why not have a vase that matches the faux finishing in your dining room? So uh, that vase has all the flowers in it. I've got a couple older paintings up there. That was one of the you know best things I ever did at that point. Um, that was from years and years and years ago. Uh, a male model who who was wonderful. He actually passed away, which was very very sad. Um, and I put a little bit of curated clutter, but I couldn't do too much up there because you can't see up there. Everything has to be sticking up. So like if there's little stuff, you can't see it. So you have to kind of be, when things are up high and you're putting your curated clutter, you got to be judicious with it and make sure it's like spiky and sticks up um, or it, it just kind of gets lost up there. So I'm going to walk you back around to the piece de resistance of the guest room. This painting right here is called Blue Balls for Scarlet. And when I named the painting Blue Balls for Scarlet, I was thinking of literal blue balls. I actually didn't know what the expression blue balls means, and I'm not gonna tell you what it is, so like if you're curious, you gotta Google it. Um, but I was thinking of literal blue balls because this painting came about right around when I was thinking about starting the whole Chicks with Balls project. This painting actually is in, it's not part of the Chicks with Balls collection, but it's in my Chicks with Balls book, my first book, because it was created at kind of a 
pivotal time. This is the, the model in this painting is my friend Cindy, who I've known for 20 years. We were preschool moms together when our kids were, you know, when our kids were like three and four. Um, and she's a nurse. She's a mom of triplets. She had three kids the same age as my oldest. And she actually, as we, you know, as our kids got older, she started taking up belly dancing. And so she's a belly dancing, belly dancer and also a belly dancing instructor. When I set up my studio in this house, one of the things that we did was sometimes a group of artists would get together and we would hire a model to pose for us. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have Cindy pose for us in her belly dancing outfit, which she did splendidly. She did such a perfect job. We, I called her the queen of stillness because she just held still like a rock and um, she just did a terrific job, you know, holding still for, the, for posing. And her outfit was beautiful, and she was beautiful. After, after the posing session, we got chatting a little bit. And um, one of the things, you know, she was talking about her kids and volleyball and stuff like that, and the drama that was, you know, going on in the, her, the girls' volleyball team. And, um, and I was talking about, you know, how I had all these paintings piling up. And so one of the things she said, which a lot of people say, oh, you should have a show. So I took the opportunity to tell her about the Chicks with Balls project, which at that point, this was like 2010, was only just super, super in the back of my mind. I, I had not put pen to paper or anything like that yet about it. I think I had only told my husband about it at that point. And um, she was kind of the litmus test because... On the spectrum of my friends, Cindy is more the on the conservative Catholic end to you know where on the other on the other end of the spectrum would be my more liberal um, free thinking friends, which I am closer to that you know that end of the spectrum. So I thought, wouldn't it be kind? I would be just kind of a good litmus test to see how. A broad variety of people might think about the whole Chips with Balls project. And when I told her about it, I was super pleasantly surprised that she was like, you know, she laughed a little bit and she thought it was fun and just a great idea. And so I thought, oh, okay, so this isn't necessarily something that's going to get me, you know, banned from all kinds of things. And people think I'm this suburban pornographer having naked people come into my studio and stuff. Um... So it really kind of lit up the fire under me a little bit. And it also, one of the things that I have, that has happened over the years with the Chicks with Balls project, it really is very apolitical. And it's intentionally apolitical. I have women that are very conservative, um, pro-life, Catholic Christians on the one end of the spectrum. I have... I have liberal free thinkers on the other end of the spectrum and a lot of women in between. Um, so I, it, Chicks with Balls will never be political because that would really be not a fair thing to do to have people pose for something only to have it later be used as a platform for views that they do not agree with. So Chicks with Balls will remain apolitical. But I, however, am political. And I have strong opinions, and my Goddess Project, which you guys have been hearing about, you know, all over the place, um, is political, and it, I do use it as a platform for my feminist pro-choice, uh, pro-choice views, and you know, so that that will that will be uh, an, hopefully an influential type thing. But chicks with balls crosses the boundaries and, you know, it, shows, it reaches across the aisle and shows how we actually can maybe all agree on some things and maybe that's a building block for agreeing on other things or working with each other at least. Anyway, um, so much for my political, my political agenda. I want to thank you all for joining me for Living Figuratively tonight. Uh, next week, it's going to be a quickie because next week... At the exact same time that Living Figuratively is happening, 
It's, it's also the Zoom virtual opening for the 73rd Ohio Annual Juried Exhibition, which takes place at the Zanesville Museum of Art in Zanesville, Ohio. Now, it's a virtual Zoom opening and the show itself is virtual. So the painting of mine that is in that show is actually in my house. So I'm gonna show that to you real quick, tell you just a little bit about her, and then turn the camera over to the Zoom opening. All the information, you do have to register for the Zoom opening, and all the information for how to register for that is on my website. So you can look on there, register for the Zoom opening, so that right after I finish talking, you can head on over and see here Ken Emmerich speaking. He's the juror for this, for the show and Lane Snyder, who is the phenomenal executive director of the, or du museum director of the Zanesville Museum of Art. She's the one that I worked with for the Chicks with Balls show. So I'm looking forward to all of it, but you can kick off your next Thursday night, same bad time, same bad channel, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, to where you join me next week for Living Figuratively, where it's a quick stop, a quick, a quick, <laughs> a quick stop to meet Emily, the 10th muse, the one who sees. That's the painting that got into the 73rd Ohio Annual. All right. Y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>